as we do usually at this time, we talk on the Seder of the week. And try to understand it in a manner that will help us in our own lives, directly, indirectly. Brighten up our brighten up our day a little bit. This Pasha is an extremely rich Pasha. Actually, it's a double header, double portion. Pasha Chukas and Pasha Bolok. So there's really much to speak on, on, uh, in every, in every, um, in, in, in each one of the Pashas and every part of it. Thank you. I thought that to start with, and I think it's I thought it was quite an important point to understand the principle of a chukah, right? Pasha's chukas, says chukas atoyim. How do we understand chukah? So I'm sure you all learned that a chukah means an edict, a decree, and the expression in the Gemara is that as Hashem says, I have issued a decree. You do not even have the permission to reflect on it and to debate it, to try to understand what it's about. I have established this decree. And we are, we are constantly explaining to ourselves and to others that we have to take the Torah and take Hashem's mitzvahs as a decree, as a command. We have to accept them, what's called with Kabbalah soil. We don't need to justify everything. We don't need to understand everything. We have to do what we are told to do. Why? Because after all, Hashem is the boss, and we have to listen to the boss, right? And if you don't listen to the boss, you get fired. fired. So if you don't want to get fired, you listen to the boss. Sounds pretty simple, but also pretty meaningless. I'm sorry? We don't see Hashem, that's also true. We don't even see the boss. <laughs> we don't even get paid. <laughs> it's not that we don't see the boss, we don't see the paycheck. Uh-huh. It's not that we don't see the boss, we don't see the paycheck. We don't see the pay well, paycheck we do see. That's not true. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't see the hand that hands it out to us. But this whole thing seems to be incongruous with a completely different phase of it. Sorry, what? Uh, incongruous. Incongruous. It doesn't fit. It's good that you ask. I don't want to... It doesn't fit with a completely different phase of, of Yiddishkeit. What is the first mitzvah that we say after Shema Yisrael, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Akin, Hashem Achod, we are half to us, Hashem Alekech. We are half to us, Hashem Alekech. You must love Hashem. Now, how can you love a, a boss who issues a decree and tells you, just do it? You're a nobody. Don't ask any questions. What does it mean? And then, at Matan Torah, we discussed it at that time. At Matan Torah, the beginning of Matan Torah, the beginning of the Aseris Adibris, he says, Onoichi Hashem Elekecho Hashem Tzisicho Meyeres Mitzrayim. I am God who took you out of the land of Mitzrayim. And we asked the question, this is not a novel question, only before you talk about it, 
Why does it say, Asher Etzichom Eretz Mitzrayim? Why does it not say, instead, a greater thing? I am your God, you have to obey me, because Asher Barosh, Yishumayim Vahoros, I created the heavens and the earth. If the principle behind mentioning it's a Sichom Eretz Mitzrayim, is the fact I took you out and therefore you owe me you owe me so to speak your, my, your service and therefore you have to listen to what I say Ashubarasa Shumayim Vahoretz is a, even a, a more convincing reason for obeying and the simple reason for this why does the Bosik say Ashubarasa Eretz Mitzrayim because as a matter of fact, Hashem says, you know, I'm giving you mitzvahs because I'm relating to you. I'm not just a distant creator. I'm relating to you. I went to Mitzrayim, you were enslaved, you were downtrodden, you were wiped out as a nation, and I, and I picked you out one by one, I identified you, and I grabbed you out of there. I'm relating to you. So now, please, follow my laws. On the contrary, this is expressing a certain relationship. Not a distance. I said, I created the heavens and the earth. It's all mine. You better listen. And then we turn around and we say, no. Zoe's hukas And, excuse me, let me just make a And it's explained further. We know that this Pasha, Chukas HaToyron, speaks about the Poro Aduma. Right? The red, uh, the red haven, the red, the red cow. What? And in fact, this mitzvah is totally beyond human comprehension. Even Shloyma HaMelech said, I fail to understand it. Totally beyond human comprehension. So, if the, the hookah principle, that it's a hookah, would pertain exclusively to this one mitzvah that is beyond human comprehension, it's completely out of balance, we cannot possibly put it together. So, you should have said, Zois hukas ha poro, the hookah of the poro. What does it say? Hukas What does Hukas HaToyra mean? Hukas HaToyra means the decree of Toyra. In other words, what it's implying here, we have a chance, if I have enough time, I'll be able to elaborate on this, but it's what it's implying here is this, that yes, indeed, we are talking about this one mitzvah of Pora Duma. But you have to understand, the Pora Duma is the symbol of the whole Torah. Chukas HaToyro, the Chuk of the Torah. Torah Aduma actually symbolizes <coughs> the ultimate principle of Torah in, in general. And what is Torah? There are many parts of the Torah that we understand to some degree. But you have to understand, the Torah says, by the way, you should know Chukas HaToyro, <coughs> just as Poro Aduma you will do because it's a chukah you should know that the whole Torah is a chukah even those parts that you understand but ultimately it's a chukah I believe that I mentioned in the past there is not a single mitzvah in the Torah Even amongst those mitzvahs that are called mishpoti, civil laws, which means supposedly we can understand these are laws that <coughs> govern interaction between human beings, between people. And they should be really understandable to the human mind. This is just, this is unjust. This is right, this is the way it should be. There's not a single mitzvah in the Torah 
that that we, the human mind, can understand all the way through every detail of it. We can understand the general gist of the mitzvah. The principle that such a mitzvah should be, should exist. But in the way it is designed in the Torah, and all the details of it, there's no way. It completely, once you get to a certain point, it completely, the mind disintegrates and loses, loses sense. Like, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> this is a, a very clear example. I mean, it's, it really is true. It really is true in every meeting that I... The example I want to give you, I'm put aside for a second, but I'll give you an example of something that you experience all the time. Shabbos. Torah says, do not do a malocha on Shabbos. What would you say is a malocha? What's a malocha? Work. 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 Carrying a handkerchief out in the street. Is that a malocha? Yeah. What? Yeah. It is a malocha. It's a malocha because the Torah said, defines it as a malocha. Of course. I'm saying in terms of, of the human understanding. No. This is not the way we understand the definition of a malacha. Shabbos really seems to make, make work, not take it away. What? Shabbos seems to make work, not take it away. <laughs> this is an illustration of something that you experience <clears throat> on a constant basis. And it's true, as I said, in every mission of the Torah. I'll give you a very classic, a blatant illustration. <clears throat> the Torah talks about Shomri. Shomri means people who agree to watch articles for others, like storage houses. Somebody agrees to watch something for safety. Listen, my dear friend, I'm going away. Uh, could you keep it until I return? Okay? Not so much. Show me. And the Torah says there are four different types of show four different types of, 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 of relationships in that, in that area of show me. It's a show chinom, one who agrees to watch, to safeguard the article, Gratis, without pay. Just doing him a favor. Shema Sokhar, one who is getting paid for watching him. And then there is a Shoyel, one who borrows the article. He borrows the article, which means he's allowed to use it, but at the same time he's responsible for safeguarding it. And then there's a Soichir, one who rents the article. Again, he is allowed to use it, but he's responsible to safeguard it. Each one of these have different parameters, different degree and levels of responsibility because of the different combination, different relationship. Somebody who watches an article for free, so we say that his obligation ends at a certain level because since he's watching for free, he obligated himself to give it a normal, a standard, a standard degree of safekeeping, not beyond the standard. So therefore, if he kept it safely in his house, an intruder came in and stole the article, he said he's not responsible. He watched it properly. He did normal watch. And therefore, he's not responsible because he has done what he has undertaken to do. If he gets paid for watching it, so then, since he gets paid, so we say, if you get paid, that means that you undertake to watch it beyond the standard. It means you have to safeguard it against the possibility of theft. To keep it in your house where it is safely in your house, but nevertheless it can be stolen, it's not safe enough. You have to hide it in a manner that is safe against theft. And if you didn't, you're obligated to pay. And so forth. Then there is the most obligated, the most responsible one is the shoyer, the borrower. 
the borrower is one who not only um, does he get paid, so to speak, but he gets paid by the article itself. The reason he's watching the article is in order for him to use it. In other words, Reuven asks Shimon, please lend me your car. Shimon says, I have my car is safe in my, in my driveway or in my garage. I don't need for safekeeping. I don't need you to help me to safeguard. Reuven says, no, not for safeguarding. Lend me your car, I want to drive it. In other words, the whole transaction is all for the sake of the user, of the borrower. The lender is not even interested in the whole transaction. It's all for his sake. So in that case, the din in Torah is that he is, his obligation is the highest and, and almost total. Whose obligation? The borrower. borrower. Whatever happens, he's obligated. There's only one exception, but basically whatever happens, he's obligated. Because it's like, almost like he transferred ownership. If you were an owner of a car, and the tree fell down on the car, would you lose the car? You would lose it. It's not your fault about it, but it, you don't have the car. Insurance-wise. The insurance-wise, that's something else. But I'm talking about the human obligation. So, and, and, and a similar... Huh? But if you have, in, in, I'll tell you why I ask this question. It sounds very weird. As you were saying that, Dr. I was just thinking about borrowing a car. Okay. And I think <laughs> the reason why you just said that, and I think the reason is because I'm not supposed to borrow this car. Okay, fine. And, and it's very All right. But Make if a person has insurance, it's not... Uh, okay, if he has insurance, this is a, a, a different uh, situation. Yes, there is insurance. Insurance has to be transferable to the borrower. He has to be of age. There are all, all kinds of restrictions on insurance. If everything is in line, it's not so bad. All right. So the borrower has the highest degree of obligation, okay? And the trader describes these, these four or three different, different categories of responsibility. Everything seems to be fitting not logically, justly, right? Everything seems to be rational. Then there is one little thing in the trader that throws a monkey wrench, so to speak, to the entire, to the entire logic. And the Torah says that if, now this may be a little complicated, and try to listen to everyone, if the owner of the article, the owner of the car, the owner of the article, whether it's a borrower, a paid watchman, a, a, a free watchman, the owner of the article did some kind of a service for the watchman or for the borrower at the time when the transaction took place, then he is absolved from all obligation. If the owner of the article, the owner of the Valabais, was did some kind of a service, some kind of work for the borrower or for the watchman at the time when he did the transaction, he gives him, okay, here, here is the key to the car. Can you give me a glass of water? Okay, at the time when he gets the key to the car, he, he serves him a glass of water. He serves so the borrower a glass of water. The borrower serves the owner ah, a glass of water. He, the borrower, did a service for the... For the owner. Okay. Then the borrower is absolved of all obligation. Literally? Literally. This is the halacha? Yeah, this is the halacha. This is the Torah. It's a loophole. It's a loophole. It's right there in the Torah, in all of Imai, Lo Yishalim. What does that mean, a service? Any kind of service. Anything, cup of water is a service. Cup of water is a service. It absolves him from all responsibility. From all, all his obligation. And the Gemara debates, the Gemara debates, in this vein, the, the one question is like this, the, the, the watchman, the free watchman, the one who watches for free, gratis, he has no obligation to say, if somebody, if, if a thief comes in and steals it, he is, he is, he is not obligated, because he watched it normal. The only time that he is obligated to pay if he is if he did not watch it, he did not give it proper safety. He left the bicycle out in front of, in, in front of his house, 
uh, unchained. Okay? He didn't watch it properly because normally you don't leave a bicycle unchained in front of your house. So in that case, he's Abigail, it's called Tshia. He was negligent. That's the only instance of obligation of the free watching if he was negligent. But if there was this situation that at the time of the transaction he did a service for the owner, there is a debate in the Gemara. One opinion is that even then he is absolved from obligation. One opinion is that in case of Shia, of negligence, that goes in a different category, and he is obligated. Do you follow what I'm saying? Only for, uh, for, for only for negligence. And only concerning a free watchman? No, no. A negligence is negligence. Whoever is negligent. Even a free watchman is obligated for negligence. And the rationale is that since he was negligent, negligence is tantamount. Tantamount is is domain. It's the same as, as damaging something with your own hand. You can never be absolved from damaging something with your own hand. Negligence is not enough. What? Negligence is not Negligence means pshia, not watching properly. Okay, so this is, this is the first thing. Okay? So here is a situation where you have a, a perfectly well-designed halacha, quote-unquote, in part of the Mishpotim um, and the category of mitzvahs. But then if you go further down into the depth of the mitzvah and go down to the details, you see that you fail to understand what this whole thing is all about. Completely. How are you gonna how are you gonna explain this? Because, in fact, the whole Torah is a chukah. Yes, there are parts of it that we can understand. But Torah is a chukah that Hashem gave us. Hashem gave it to us. Hashem did not say, okay, you know, wise men, you're all wise people, design some proper laws. Like the American Congress designs laws. Design some proper laws. No, not, none of that. The laws are all given from Hashem. Even the most basic, fundamental, civil laws are given from Hashem. And they describe the Torah the way they are. And, ma- and as I said, there's, there's none that can be explained all the way to the, to the end, to the, to the last detail. Chukas a Torah. The whole Torah is a chuk. So now, we really would like to understand what is this about? If the Torah is meant to give us a way of life and to make us, so to speak, intelligent human beings, living a civil and a, and a meaningful and a good life, a proper life, how can it be then? That that it's all it's all completely beyond our understanding, completely ignoring our own inter- intellect. The best we could say, I understand what you're telling me, but I don't understand why you're telling it to me. How is this a Torah that you say this is Torah for you, to you to live by? This is the Torah that's going to bring life into your, in, in, into your existence. And the Torah, so to speak, uncompromisingly and without apologies, says, Chukas HaTorah. That is in fact the Chuk. And at the same time it says, V'yahavtos Hashem Alekecha. And at the same time it says, I don't know if you're familiar with that quote. This is later on. When Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Yidin, you should know that the Torah, this is what makes you wise. 
This is what represents you as wise, a wise people in the eyes of the nations. So what is in fact this principle of Chukah? So, to understand it, I want to use an, an analogy from, a, from another aspect of, of, of total life and of life in general. You know that in the Torah there is the, the, the mitzvah of a melech a king. We, since we never experience that type of a, of a personage, someone who is a king, except for the Rebbe, you could, you could actually, so to speak, project from knowing the Rebbe and from understanding him, you know, having had any kind of exposure to understand the concept of a king. What was a king? A king has specific laws in the Torah. How the people are to relate to the king. And in the Torah, the king is really an absolute monarch, absolute ruler. He's, he is really... Um, he rules the whole land by edict, by decree. What is it in this human being that the Torah permits him to rule other human beings? We see that when it comes to other aspects of Torah life, say for instance, court system, judges, judges, so you know from, from Moshe Rabbeinu also, you must have learned already, but we know there's a mitzvah in the Torah, and later on you learn about shayfim v'shayfim. Judges are instead there is a whole system of courts of court um, of, of courts in Israel. A judge is not an absolute ruler. A judge is not allowed to rule by himself. You have to have a number of people, and there are different levels. If you can't come to a conclusion, you go to a higher level and higher level, all the way to the Sanhedrin in Yerushalayim. And how do they rule? They rule by majority vote, majority opinion. That's the law in the Torah. You go by majority opinion. Nobody is a boss. Nobody can say, tell anybody what to do. It says that Bezhilil and Beshama. You heard, I'm sure, from Bezhilil and Beshama. There were two schools by schools, Talmudic schools that, uh, that were led by these two giants of Hillel and Shammai. And they had different approaches to, to, to Halotha, to Torah. And, and, and there are many instances where they had the disputes, different opinions as to a certain Halotha. And, and th- these disputes were recorded in the Mishnahs, the Hillelim and the Shammaiim, and the halacha is almost invariably, without some exception, the halacha is like the Bezhila. The halacha is like the Bezhila. So it says, what is the reason that the halacha is like the Bezhila? You would think the halacha is like Bezhila because they were greater scholars. They were sharper minds. And it says just the opposite. The Beshamai were sharper minds and were greater scholars. But because they were sharper minds, so the, the more common scholar couldn't understand what they were saying. And that's why the majority opinion ended up like the Bezhila. And that's why the Halacha is like the Bezhila, because they were the majority opinion. And it says further, that the Mashiach will come and everybody will reach a higher 
degree of scholarship, then the halacha will revert back to being halacha like Bisham. So we have no dictators. Everything has to be acceptable. And if the majority of people cannot understand that particular form of logic, then, <coughs> then, it, then it doesn't go. <coughs> the Yomorah says the same thing about Reb Meir. Reb Meir is very, very common in the Mishnah. I'm sure you, you came across Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda. Almost in every Mishnah is a Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda. What? Reb Meir? No, no, not Reb Meir. Alicia. Reb Meir, no, Reb Meir, no. So Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda, they, they, throughout the whole Mishnah, it's Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda. And the klal is that Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda, and there's a machlok between Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda, the halacha is like Reb Yehuda. And the Gemara says, again, the similar thing, that Reb Meir, why was he called Reb Meir? Reb Meir means shining. Because Meir Ene Chachom Behaloch that used to illuminate, he used to come in with his reasoning, he used to brighten up the yeshiva. But the halacha is not like Reb Meir. Why? Because Le Yom Du Chachomim Le Soiv Daite Chachomim couldn't fully comprehend what he was saying. It was so deep, and so profound, they could not fully understand, and therefore they couldn't pass in the halacha like this. And that's what the halach is like a behud. So we see that the Torah, all the way from the beginning, already established a system where everybody is involved and everybody is able to relate to it. And even if, if one is a greater scholar, you have to have majority opinion. And everybody has to be able to concur. And if you cannot appear, Master a majority opinion, you don't have the halacha, you may be the greatest scholar. There's no dictatorship in either scholar. And yet, when it comes to a melech, a king, he truly is a dictator. He rules by edict. There is no, there is no system, there is no system of Congress, of of there is no system, there is no um, cabinet that he has to consult with. He rules, he, he can consult whoever he wants to, but he rules according to the way he wants. On the civil, so to speak, on the, on the, on the governmental level, there is no system. There is the king and this is it. So you would ask a question, why? And this is a Torah. The king is, is, a, is a Torah of a, a principle. And we're waiting for Mashiach to be our king. What's behind the spirit? What is, what is behind it? What is the king? So, to explain this, we can actually, in our day, in our times, we can very readily relate to this, to this principle. In our times, where we have reached, you're all familiar, so you have to understand and you have to understand how, how to judge it and how to, to stay above it. Um, there's complete anarchy, complete chaos in terms of principle. Anybody can come up with any kind of an idea and he says, I believe that you're supposed to walk on your head instead of on your feet. So he walks on his head and everybody screams and says, hey, give him his room, he has the right, First Amendment, he can do, you can walk on his head. <laughs> there, uh, there are no, the, the whole uh, the principle of life, so to speak, any kind of 
of recognition that life is to be lived in a certain way it has completely dissipated. Everything is arbitrary. Everything is conventional. Conventional means that people agree among themselves. Why this, how does this happen? What is the, the principle? The principle is, if you forget about God, if you forget, if you don't recognize that there is something real going on, I'll come back more in detail to this. But just, we can readily understand, and there is nothing higher that's holding up the world, so everything falls down to its base, base level. So everything becomes chaotic, everything goes, goes into, its own, into its own world. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> many people choose some kind of, a, of, a, of an odd mode of life, not because they like it, but because they just not to conform to whatever else somebody else is doing. Not because this, they say, I don't, want, I don't want to be like you. So that's it. That's my preference. That becomes, that becomes a culture, that becomes a way of life. What does this tell us? Even though we're talking about people who have a mind and a heart, have seichel and midas and so forth, with seichel and with midas and with all the human qualities, there has to be a spirit. There has to be a a <coughs> a light that holds all that up that keeps it up. Just like we discussed sometime in the past, that the human being walks on two feet, he stands on two feet. Animals, they walk on four, or they crawl on the ground. This, the fact that the human being walks on two, so I'll explain then that this is not physically balanced. Physically, you're much safer to stand on four. Just like this table cannot stand on two, you can stand on four. So physically speaking, it is safer, it is more logical that you should stand on four. When you stand on two, you, you would seem to be out of balance. And yet a human being is very well balanced. What makes him balanced? The animal we can understand because he stands, he is properly, properly structured. What makes the human being stand on two so safely? The answer is, it's not his physique, physique, it's not his physical design that makes him stand. It's not his feet that hold him up. It's his head. The spirit that's in his head is what's holding, holding him up. The reason he's standing is because he is being carried aloof. He's held up by his spirit, by his head. The feet are just touching the ground. That's all it is. But what's really balancing him is his head completely. It's the spirit, the neshama. And the human neshama, what does it say? Ruach ha'odom, oil olamailo. The spirit of the human spirit, as a possible. Human spirit is oil olamailo. Rising upwards. Yeruach HaBehema, the spirit of the Behema, is here at the Slamata. So the Behema looks to, for, for its balance and for its safety on the ground, and the human being looks for his balance up in the sky. He's being held up by his head. And now, with this understanding what a human being is in general, you will understand what is the function of a king. When you have a nation of people, and they all have seichel, they all have their, their intellect, and they all have their principles that they understand with their intellect. All of that that they understand with their intellect, even at the highest level, 
has, so to speak, the limit of human understanding. He understands that in this world, you know, there are, there's right and wrong in this world. You have to live in a certain way. The king, the Torah describes the first king, Shaul HaMelech. And when Shaul HaMelech was chosen to be king by Shmuel HaMelech. So it says there about Shaul, Mishich Mo'ivomailo Goveyo Mikol Ho'om. That's how Pesach in Tanakh. Pesach in Tanakh. Mishich Mo'ivomailo Goveyo Mikol Ho'om. That's from That from his shoulder up, he was of higher and above all the people. So simply it means that he was simply structured, he was a very presentable personage physically, but that's not what it's talking about. Really what it's talking about is <coughs> that all the wisdom, all the intellectual power that existed by other people reached up to his shoulder. In other words, they were only able to understand up to his emotion which includes the heart. But to understand his, his insight, he was above it all. He was above the whole, the whole fray, the whole world. And thus, this illustrates to us what is the union of a melech. A melech is the one, this is, I'll come back, this is why the people long to have a melech. They go and they willingly, they willingly submit themselves, give up, so to speak, their individual freedom, and beg the Melech to be their king. Why? Because by associating with the Melech, they get elevated to his level. Even though they will not comprehend his level, because they cannot comprehend his mind but he gives them the spirit to live up to, to that level, even if they don't understand. We can illustrate it in our day, Baruch Hashem. We have the Rebbe Shluchim. The Shluchim. There are thousands of Shluchim, thousands. Not a few elite, you know, people with special talent, special capability, special education. No. Simple people. Very simple people. And they go out and they become shluchim of the head. And in this thing that they become shluchim, the power with which they approach their shluchim the power, the spirit which they, they execute, they follow through on their work is not something that they themselves can even surmise, can even imagine that they were able to be able to do it. It's completely beyond their understanding. They recognize that they go with this with the koyach, what's called the koyach hamishaloyach, the koyach of the one who sent them. Let's take a very simple, very simple illustration. Everybody knows the mitzvah of Ahavas Yisrael. And everybody is concerned, Ahavas Yisrael is concerned about his fellow Jew. He loves every Yid. He's concerned about every Jew. The normal Yid, every one of us individual. We all have our system. But to what extent? Does that mean that you're not going to go, you're going to have sleepless nights? You're going to go and, and, and give up everything else because you need to save Ayyidin from Kiel Shabbos? Yeah, I'm concerned. I'll try to help you. But I'm, I, can, I, I can go on with my life. When you are associated with the Rebbe, and you have the Rebbe's spirit, the Rebbe's inspiration, from Rebbe there was absolutely no limit. A yid that lives, that lives in some kind of a, <coughs> of a hick town, someplace in, in, in India, among the monkeys, 
They're most concerned about it. And the shluchim have a similar approach. If they have, if somebody calls them up, listen, Ayid, this bochet is going to marry a, 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 a non-Jewish girl. They, they throw everything away, they don't eat, they don't sleep, they have to save this bochet. That's not a normal spirit. That's a spirit that of, of a tremendous, a tremendous elevation that normal human beings don't have it. As much as you're concerned about another need. As much as you can give tzedakah and pray, but still, there's a limit. I still have to take care of my family. I have to take care of my Chabad house. Huh? They're beyond soldiers. They're generals. They, they're concerned about, about the ultimate result. They have to save this guy. And they do all kinds of things that are completely, they themselves don't believe how I dare to say it. In other words, what, what we get from a melech is just like the head inspires the whole body and holds up the body, the melech holds up the whole person. The melech elevates the whole nation. The melech gives is the spirit of the whole nation and puts the whole nation on a completely different heel and different level. That's what the name of a melech is. This is why a melech rules by decree because to the melech for him to explain his idea is impossible the only way you can relate to the melech is if you become related to him you become his subject and you say oh he is my king and this is my spirit and therefore you do what he says to do and then you do what he says for you to do. And you don't even understand why this is going to work. But lo and behold, it works. It works. It goes. Now we will come back to the principle of chukot. We'll understand what is chukas ha and why the Torah is a chukot. The Torah is a chukah, which means that we are not to question, and we are try to understand something. We try to understand, and some things. The Torah said this is a chukah, and ein lo chorushus lahara. You can't even have a shoes, You don't even you don't even have an approach to try to understand. It's a chukah. But what is the principle of this chukah? Where, what's behind it? How is this? How is this hookah acceptable to an intelligent human being? How can one accept a hookah while he says, oh, but I'm intelligent? How intelligent can you be when you just accept a, a, a decree without in, inquiring about it, without questioning it? And the answer is, just because you're intelligent, and the country, the more intelligent you are, the more you understand that the, 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 the relationship and the presence of Hashem in, in the world, Hashem's presence in the world, and the value of Hashem's presence in the world. You don't need the world without Hashem's presence. It's meaningless. Hukah, in fact, represents the principle that Hashem is with us in our lives. Not as it would appear to be, just the opposite. I give you a decree and don't bother me. The hookah represents just the country. The exact opposite. Because an Hashem is part of our lives, and He is with us, wherever we are, in our lives, in our daily lives, this is why there is a hookah. Because in order to maintain this, this presence and this relationship, we have to have a hookah because there's no other way that this presence, or that the presence can be transmitted, can be explained to us. This is beyond our intellect. Mm-hmm. 
What is the Chukas HaToyra that this Posik speaks about, the Torah over here? It speaks about the Poro Aduma. What is the Poro Aduma? Poro Aduma is a means to be metahir a tome mess, which means that if a person became tome, impure, unclean, how did he become impure and unclean? Did he do a big Aveira? Did he do some kind of a transgression? He became impure, unclean, because he touched a lifeless body of another human being. And what was wrong with that? He was involved in, in burying the dead, which is a tremendous mitzvah. And this union that there is such a thing as life and then end of life, this is a natural thing in the world. Nothing embarrassing, nothing shameful about it, at least within the realm, just within the context of our world, that's the way it is, that's the way the world goes. Life is very, very dear and very bright and very great. And in, in its context, in its, in its essence, it's, it's endless. It's infinite, but nevertheless, the physical life does end. So what's, what's, what's impure about it? The impurity of it is not in the context of the world. Impurity, impurity right? It's not in the context of the world. There's nothing wrong for it, of a, in, in, so to speak, within the worldly context. What's impure about it? The whole concept of death exists exclusively in the worldly context because God in a godly realm, such thing doesn't exist at all. It doesn't exist. It cannot be. And therefore, since we need God's presence in our, with us, in order to have God's presence with, in, in, with us, we have to, we have to, this becomes a source of impurity because, because this sense of lifelessness and godliness don't pair up, don't go together. Because godliness doesn't have, doesn't, include, doesn't have that concept at all. As a matter of fact, you know, what is this impurity about that? Somebody touched a lifeless body, so he becomes impure. So what, what is this impurity, how does it affect him? It affects him nothing. Nothing. He can go on and daven and learn and do mitzvahs. It limits nothing. Only time it limits him is when he wants to go into his amigdash. He wants to go into the Mishkan. Why? Because in the Mishkan, where the Shekhinah is revealed, there that doesn't go together. Because there there's a Godly presence. And in Godly presence, the whole, this, this, this is an impurity. This is contrary to the whole union of Godliness. So therefore, what is this Chukas HaToyro represent? Because that Hashem is with us, Hashem is with us in our continuous life and our daily life. And everything that we do, like I explained before, we have mitzvahs in the Torah, mitzvahs of shoimrim, of watchmen. But the mitzvahs of watchmen are not mitzvahs that are completely contained within our world. It's explainable completely within our, our world. It's still... There's still a godly spirit in it, a godly um, um, 
perception in there. Because we see that the logic, our logic completely fails to explain it at some, some point in time. Even in our civil laws, in our civil interactions, they're not based on our understanding of it and on our world. It's based on Hashem's presence with us. And this is why the laws are not all understandable. There's a certain point where they're not understandable. And this is the principle of a chukah. The chukah clearly states that not contrary to what it seems that Hashem is distant from us, the chukah states that Hashem is extremely close with us. And he is a partner. He's, he is right there with, our, with us in our lives. And this is why we have a chukah. Because we have to live according to, in a way that will conform and will permit his presence with us. Which can only be through a chukah. Because the way we understand things, we understand things within a world, the context. And as I said, the end of life is perfectly natural within a worldly context. In a godly context, it's completely out. So the chukah truly elevates. And the chukah, as we said, it's chukah sa toira. The whole toira is a chukah. The whole toira represents Hashem's presence in our world. Hashem's presence, Hashem's closeness, and it presents how we, on a constant basis, live not in a worldly world, but in a godly world. And every mitzvah in the Torah represents this this principle, because the underlying factor of every mitzvah in the Torah is a chukah. Chukah is a Torah. The whole Torah is a chukah. There is the level, the degree that we can make sense of it in our context, in our level, in our world, and then we know that it goes beyond that. And it's it's God's it's 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 it's, it's God's laws, it's God's world. And thus, this is why we say the Torah elevates. The Torah does not merely puts us in place and gives us a way to live in our world. It elevates. It picks us up. It, it, it frees us. Frees us. Frees means it, 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 it gives us chayrut. It frees us up from the world. That's why Mat and Torah declared Eden as free people. Free from what? Free from the natural world. It frees us from all, from all constraints of the natural world. And we, we can contemplate, contemplate, we can understand, we can direct our activities, not according to the way the natural world demands, but according to the way the Torah demands. This is the freedom that Hashem gave us in modern Torah. This is, this explains the, 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 the great blessing and the great power and, and um, um, how the Torah is really a life force that, that puts us into, and what's also called Beker and Oira, puts us in a bright light, in bright life, because it, it takes, picks us out, takes us out from the limits of the natural world and, and places us and lifts us to the point where we can live according to the seichel according to to to, to uh, Torah precepts it literally gives us a brighter life not just a just life a successful life a brighter life a higher life And everyone 
Allah's here who was Zoycha to whatever degree, to whatever level, to whatever amount of time to be in, in, in a yeshiva, to be in Rebbe's yeshiva and to learn Torah truly, in purity as a chukah, understanding that this is Hashem's Torah this is a special schus, a special koyach and this schus and this koyach will help you all to carry to go through your world on a higher and more and, and, a, and a brighter manner completely you would think oh I'm doing the same thing that, that the Havdul the, the Havdul the Nanju does outside it's not the same thing not the same thing at all there's no comparison with you. even when you eat it's a different food than what he does not because it's kosher I'm talking about it. It's a different thing. He eats food from the ground and you eat Hashem's food. It's a different food. Your food, Hashem feeds you, hand feeds, feeds you in your mouth, and He eats what He grabbed from the ground. He eats grass and you eat food. It's a different, different story. We should all be successful in your lives. Um, I'm not going to go